All right. Thank you very much, uh, Hanko. I, uh, I certainly appreciate the nice and kind uh, introduction, as well as the invitation to speak here at the Friends of the Library. Uh, I'm happy to be a friend of the library. Uh, so so t today's talk is going to be largely uh, based on uh, what the field of blood blood uh, contacting devices look like, all right? Um, it was some of the challenges uh, that we currently face in the field, uh, as well as uh, what are some of the uh, solutions or approaches being taken to, to uh, mitigate or, or resolve these challenges, okay? Uh, and I would focus mainly on, uh, on the fact that whenever blood contacting devices interact with blood, uh, what happens is the activation of the blood uh, into clots, and the clots can shut off the surfaces of these devices and basically end up anywhere in your body. Anywhere that blood flows uh, to your body, the clot can end up there and, and cause embolism. Okay? So uh, I would speak to that, and I would speak to the fact that Whenever you have an artificial device being implanted in the body or, or interfacing with your body, there is a, there's a likelihood of uh, bacteria introduction into your body. Uh, bacteria can attach to, to these devices, uh, multiply, uh, lead to an infection, or even sepsis. Okay? It can get into the bloodstream and cause, sep cause uh, sepsis. All right, so let's get to the talk. Uh, some of you in the audience might be familiar with uh, this face, uh, my first slide. His name is Francesco, and he's wearing a, a distinguished uh, mustache. Uh, he's also, he also has a cigarette. Uh, he's, a, he's a very good friend of mine. Uh, we were in, in graduate school together. Right? So he doesn't mind me showing his face uh, in, my, in my slides. Uh, so for now, we're just going to assume that Francesco has uh, an end-stage lung disease. And by that I mean his lungs are so bad, all right, that even a bad, you know, a bad cough can, can result, result in his death. Or, or, or more uh, technically, uh, a slight exacerbation of his lung disease state can lead to uh, lung failure and therefore uh, death, okay? Uh, there, the, the only treatment for Francesco would be for physicians to go procure a lung from another person okay, and transplant the lung into uh, Francesco. That is the only treatment we have. Okay. Anything else would be uh, geared towards supporting his life until they find a lung that is suitable for him and then he gets transplanted. Okay. There are actually about 3,500 people like Francesco that get waitlisted to receive a donor lung each year in the US. Okay. Only 28%, 20, about 29% actually get transplanted. That means, you know, you put so many people on the waitlist to receive a lung, just a small fraction of the people will, will actually uh, get transplanted, all right? A large percentage of them would have to wait more than five years just to, to, to find a lung and get transplanted into them. And some would wait and not receive the lung, and, and they'll pass on, you know, sadly. Okay? Uh, so the, the odds of Francesco actually receiving a dolo lung, all right, it, it is, hasn't, hasn't improved, actually has, has gotten worse over the years. This graph here uh, is taken from the NIH website, which shows, the clear bar shows the number of Donor long, the number of patients that actually get transplanted over the years, and then the harsh bars show the number of donor lungs that are available each year. So you can see that the gap between the harsh bar and the clear bar keeps increasing. Right, that means Francesco had better odds of getting a lung in the 90s than actually getting a, a lung right now. Okay. So if there are some good people out there in the audience, what you can do is uh, you know, put your name on the donor list, the organ donor list, and uh, you know, his odds of receiving a donor lung 
it will become better. Okay. So if currently we don't have enough lungs to support somebody like Francesco, how do we keep him alive? How do we prevent him from you know, passing on uh, uh, and keep him alive and, 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 and get him a donor lung? We have to put him on a, a device, some device that is able to function just like the artificial lung, okay? yeah, like the natural lung. You know, it would have to provide ox oxygen to the body, to the tissue, and remove carbon dioxide. Yeah. That's what the, 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 such a device would have to do. Actually, there is a device like this on the market. Right? It is uh, it's a few companies uh, make and sell these devices, and they use clinically uh, right now, and it's called the artificial lung. Uh, it's, uh, it's essentially a, a membrane oxygenation technique where you have blood flowing on one side of the membrane. This blood will be coming from Francesco. It will be shunted from his body into the device. The blood will flow. You can think of a partition where blood is flowing on one side of the membrane. And then you have oxygen and carbon dioxide flowing on the other side of the membrane. So there will be, uh, at any time and point, uh, the blood will have uh, less partial pressure of oxygen than in the airflow, so oxygen will transfer into the blood. And then the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood will be higher than in the air, so carbon dioxide would leave the blood and will be carried out uh, away from his body. Okay. So the artificial lung is one of many, one of about 200 million blood contacting devices that are used yearly in the US alone. Uh, this picture here is the artificial lung is a blood contacting device because blood would have to interact intimately with the device. Uh, this is a, a vascular graft. Same thing, blood flows through it and out. This is a vascular patch. Uh, if you have a, a aneurysm or a weakened blood vessel, they can put a patch at the weakened spot to prevent uh, your blood vessel from rupturing. This is a catheter. This is a stent. And this is an uh, artificial kidney, a dialysis machine. All right. So there, there, there are so many of these uh, devices in the market. And they, they help support patients with a host of diseases, pulmonary diseases, coronary diseases, aneurysm, uh, heart diseases. Okay? And their material makeup, the, what, what, you know, they, they, we use artificial materials to make these devices. And the, the uh, materials range from, could be polypropylene uh, to silicone all the way to uh, PTFE, okay? So all of these are artificial materials. And uh, whenever you have an artificial material interacting with blood, uh, only one thing would happen. You, ha you would have clots uh, beginning to form on the surface of the artificial material, okay? So all these devices, they work by intimately interacting with blood, that leads to clotting. Uh, we currently, we, we have a pretty good sense of, of uh, what we think is happening, all right? This, the interaction between blood and biomaterials. We have a pretty good sense of what we think is happening, uh, but to be honest with you, is is like anything else, it's a model. We think, uh, we think of models, because we can't, uh, we cannot be sure of what exactly is happening. So the model I'm going to show you is a very simplified version of uh, biomaterial induced clot formation. Okay. <coughs> so you put, let's say, you put a catheter in in your blood vessel. Blood is flowing over it. You have so many uh, proteins in blood that play a role in in Clot, blood coagulation, okay? So the first proteins that would absorb on the surface of your, of your biomaterial uh, are uh, factor 12, factor 11, and higher molecular weight kinetogen. So these are called contact system, system proteins. So they auto-absorb. They would, as soon as they see any, any artificial surface, which is foreign to what the biological media they're used to, they ought to absorb on the surface. And when they do, they denature. Proteins would unfold, right? And then they expose your binding sites. 
when that happens, other proteins like factor 10 can come in to absorb. And then you have uh, platelets. The body's in green. Platelet. Platelets are very, very important in blood coagulation. I think without platelets, you can't have solid clots from forming. So I want you, you should keep that in mind. Um, so the platelets come in and then they bind. And when they bind, they eventually uh, rupture their cellular membrane and release all their intracellular contents. They will release their dense particles and light particles. And these particles are also uh, procoagulant. So when they release these particles, it will go where? Into your blood. It will go into your blood and it will flow through your blood. And because these particles are also procoagulant, they will interact with platelets that are not on the surface yet, but flowing by in your blood. They will activate those platelets, and those platelets will eventually come and absorb. So you can see, think of, you know, and that step is like uh, propagation of blood coagulation. All right. And then you also have white cells. White cells interact with platelets. They can bind to surface-bound platelets. So they come in, attach themselves. Red cells also come in and attach themselves. And then you have uh, another important procoagulant factor called uh, fibrinogen. Fibrinogen uh, would, would polymerize uh, all around. So the, the dark lines, uh, you can think of them as uh, threads uh, or, or fibrin. That has been formed from fibrinogen. So they wrap around the clot to solidify it. So without fibrinogen, the clot will be loose and it, can be, it, it wouldn't be able to grow into micro or, or bigger aggregates. All right. Uh, so fibrinogen and platelets are very, very important in, in clot formation. So this is a very oversimplified uh, uh, biomaterial blood interaction leading to clot. There's a lot of more detail uh, in between uh, the, the absorption of protein and clot formation. <coughs> I think for the purposes of this talk, uh, yeah, I think it's enough to give you a sense of what happens. All right, so what happens? Uh, you, you have a clot on the surface. It forms, it, it grows, it keeps growing, and then you also have blood flowing along that clot on the surface of that, you know. So you, you have shear stress playing in a row, and with enough uh, shear, the clots can dislodge off of the, of, of the device, and then it will flow every, anywhere. It can end up in your brain, right? It can end up in your heart, your lungs, and let's say you have a little tube with blood flowing and there's a clot here. Blood is not going to be able to flow past the cl uh, clot. So any t all the tissue downstream where the clot is, is not going to be oxygenated, right? You're going to have ischemia. It, the tissue is going to start to die. Okay. Uh, so and that, that it's called embolism, wherever you have the, the clot uh, uh, preventing flow of blood. And that can lead to interactive care. You know, you have an embolism, the physician has to, uh, whatever, whatever device that's causing the embolism, the physician has to go in and pull the device out, replace it. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, with clots, you have poor device function uh, for artificial lungs. That works by transferring gases in, our, in, a, in and out of blood. Uh, if you have clots forming on the membrane, the gas transfer membrane, its gas transfer uh, efficiency is going to drop, okay? And it, it will drop and keep dropping until you have to pull the device out, okay? So what is being done clinically to prevent uh, clots from forming on, um, on blood contacting devices? We've all heard about heparin. It's a blood thinner. We've heard about aspirin as well. People take aspirin. Uh, we've heard maybe a wafer not so much, or clopidogrel. Right. All of these uh, systems, they, they, so basically you take them and it goes into your blood. They, they, so they will act systemically. They will go everywhere in your body. Um, heparin will prevent thrombin from forming. Uh, clopidogrel will prevent platelet, which I said was an important uh, clotting factor, from being activated. So clopidogrel is like is a competitive uh, competitive 
uh, agonist to ADP. All right, so it would, it would block uh, ADP from activating the platelet, and aspirin will actually get into your platelet and stop the platelet from uh, uh, re uh, releasing all its internal clotting factors, like thrombosine A2, uh, et cetera. So uh, this is how this, so, but the, the thing is, what, what I want you to keep in mind is all these drugs would work. You take it and it will go everywhere in your body. So if you have uh, a compromised uh, clotting system and you take these drugs, uh, it makes it even worse. You, you have a small cut. Your, your natural cl uh, clotting system cannot kick in and you don't, you can bleed and keep bleeding and, 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 and can lead to uh, death actually. Another so, uh, approach that is being used to control clots on, on medical devices is uh, surface coatings, okay? There are two groups. Uh, one is heparin coatings, the other is uh, non-fouling coatings. Heparin coatings would work, so you, you can think of a surface that has a, a polymer coating on it, and the coating would have to uh, complex with uh, another a protein called uh, antithrombin-3 in order to be effective at inhibiting clots from forming, okay? So this requires like one step, a step in between before it can actually do some good. Uh, here, uh, the, the coating would attract a lot of water. If you put the coating on a device, uh, the coating would attract a lot of water onto the device and form a very sturdy uh, hydrophilic layer, sort of like a boundary between the, the procoagulant medical device surface and blood. So it's, it's gonna prevent proteins from actually seeing the device surface. Okay, so, but you know, the, these, these uh, approaches have, have shown a lot of benefit, all right? However, they're not without shortcomings. Uh, the, the, the systemic anticoagulants, yes, they would inhibit clots from forming on the device surface, but because the actions are systemic, they would also inhibit clots from, form, uh, clots, uh, uh, from forming anywhere in your body. So if you have a cut, let's say somewhere in your body, you, you, uh, because you're taking systemic anticoagulants, your body is not able to uh, activate your natural clotting system to stop you from bleeding. So that's the, uh, the bad uh, side effect of that. And then with coatings, uh, what has been tried <coughs> clinically they all don't last. You know, after two weeks, they tend to stop to work. And then the devices will start to clot again. Um, and so, I've, so, so far I've talked about uh, clotting uh, and the fact that it's an issue in, in, in blood contacting medical devices. Uh, Bacteria-related infection is also a problem because uh, whenever you have uh, poor air quality in the operating room, Okay, or uh, in incomplete skin or material disinfection, or uh, not applying uh, antibiotic prophylaxis, or, or working on the patient with, a, with an impaired immune system, all right, bacteria can attach to the device surface, all right, uh, form micro aggregates, uh, form biofilm around them, and become antibiotic resistant, and then they can multiply cause uh, implant site infection, they can get into the bloodstream and cause sepsis. And sepsis can lead to multiple organ failure. Uh, it's a very difficult <coughs> condition to treat. Okay, so how do we prevent uh, blood from clotting or coagulating and bacteria from growing on these devices? Uh, we look to how nature does it. Uh, it turns out blood vessels, blood vessels, uh, uh, aligned with cells called endothelial cells. And these cells uh, uh, generate nitric oxide gas. Um, they also, the cellular membranes uh, have uh, hydrophilic groups called uh, phosphorylcholine. Uh, so, and the NO is released and interacts with platelets. It acquiesces uh, the platelet from activating. And then because of the, the PC, uh, moieties on the cellular membrane, you have a tight hydration layer on the surface of the blood vessel. So this forms a barrier 
proteins cannot uh, adsorb on these surfaces. There are other functions of the blood vessel, like TPA as an enzyme that, that the endothelial cells uses to, to break down clots that uh, form. Let's say you have a cut, your coagulation system kicks in, right? Kicks in, it wants you, st it wants you to stop bleeding, so it will kick in and plug the hole, the dynamic side of the, bl of the uh, blood vessel. Uh, but as after at some point when you stop bleeding, uh, the, clot, the clot formation has to stop. Otherwise, it's going to grow and keep growing and occlude your vessel. So it stops growing, and then TPA is overexpressed to basically chop down the clot that is formed at that site. All right, so this is all I just said. Uh, nitric oxide is released at uh, known levels, and they work on platelets, and PC expressed on membranes to cause uh, non fouling effect. And these are the other functions. Uh, so how does, uh, how does nitric oxide work I inside uh, the platelet? So nitric oxide is a lipophilic uh, molecule. And so it's able to cross the uh, membrane of the platelet very easily. So the, it's, a, it's a bilipid layer, right? Cell membranes are bilipid layers. They, ha they, have, a, they have a fat uh, core. And this is a fat-loving uh, a molecule, it crosses easily. Once inside a platelet, it, what it's going to do is prevent so, uh, the normal reaction that would take place in order for the, for the platelet to release, to release its uh, uh, procoagulant intracellular uh, 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 proteins. Okay, so the NO would stop all these from happening. One major uh, uh, point is where the, cal the calcium stores inside the platelet will be released so that the membrane can change shape and, and, and so the platelet can release uh, its uh, uh, clotting factors. So it stops that from happening. Um, nitric oxide uh, has al is also being used to, to prevent bacterial growth uh, and multiplication. Uh, and in the right quantities, okay, so let's say you have, a, this is your bacteria, this is the bacterial membrane, <coughs> and this is the inside of the bacteria. You expose the bacteria to enough uh, nitric oxide concentration, it will disrupt the membrane structure of the bacteria and also cause oxidative stresses on the DNA of the bacteria. Uh, basically, if you d destroy the cellular membrane of the bacteria, it's going to die, and that's how. Uh, there's a few uh, papers out there looking at the bactericidal effect of uh, nitric oxide. All right, so I'm going to change gears a little bit to look at how you can incorporate nitric oxide release into medical devices. Uh, I'm going to talk about catheters. So nitric oxide, you can put nitric oxide into uh, polymers or artificial materials by incorporating, by, like, there, there are a class of compounds called nitric oxide donors. You can put these donors into the polymer once you, you polymerize the polymer. You can also put amine compounds into the polymer, polymerize the polymer, and then put the polymer in, in a high pressure nitric oxide environment. And the nitric oxide will now go and attach itself into the amine that you, you, are, you trapped inside the polymer. You can also put a catalyst on top of the blood contacting surface and then when you put the device inside the patient, our blood already has uh, nitric oxide donors like cysteine. The uh, amino acid cysteine ca carries nitric oxide with it. So when, uh, we, so we call those uh, compounds that carry nitric oxide in blood, we call them RSNOs. When they interact with the catalyst on the surface of the material, uh, the catalyst would catalyze or break the compound into NO and its component. However, if, you, if you're working with, let's say, an artificial, uh, artificial lung where it involves the flow of gases, you can, that, this is like the easiest uh, route. You can buy the nitric oxide gas and bl blend the gas into the oxygen or nitrogen, uh, uh, and, uh, you, and then you have a nitric oxide releasing um, uh, membrane. To, to prevent clots from forming. This is not so easy to do. 
because nitric oxide can react with oxygen and f uh, to form uh, toxic compounds. So there's a, a, a big group of people looking at, at that. All right, so how do we make the, how do you make a catheter to release nitric oxide? Um, this here is a cartoon of the cross section of a catheter that we've made in the past. Uh, it's a trilaminar uh, catheter where the inside layer in gray is only silicon with a, a hardened material called fume silica. And then the green layer is the active layer where we can put amine compounds inside that layer. Okay, and then the top layer is also silicon. And then we take the cat. So the way we make the catheter is we, we will uh, take a mandrel, just a stainless steel rod, and dip coat it with uh, the material that you want to make the catheter out of, cure it, and remove the mandrel. Uh, and this is, so this is the process. This is the mandrel. It's a dye. Uh, you, you put the mandrel through, through the dye where you feed uh, uh, resin through the here and then it will coat the mandrel. And then once you have the catheter, you put, them, you put the catheters in a high pressure uh, nitric oxide environment so that the nitric oxide will permeate into the, into the catheter wall, get into the middle layer and attach itself to the amine groups that you already put, you put during uh, the extrusion process. So one of my students is going to be working on uh, develop, uh, building this uh, nitric oxide reactor in, in the lab. Uh, so I think this is the first time she's actually seen this. Um, so so the, cath the catheters we made uh, is here. Uh, this is the extruder catheter, and it's been filled, filled with a dye. So you can see that it's a tube, and it was attached to a, a hub. And this is uh, an optical image of the cross section of the catheter. This is the inner layer, the active layer, and then the top layer. Uh, we looked at how much nitric oxide we can release from the catheter. Um, this graph shows the amount of NO release when we don't have, so we were looking at the effect, how much amine do we have, we have to put in to get how much uh, nitric oxide release. And the method of measuring nitric oxide is by chemiluminescence. We have a uh, instrument in our lab currently. Um, and so you can see that most of the nitric oxide is released within the first hour, and then you almost deplete the amount of nitric oxide. So all these uh, samples were without a pH uh, stabilizing additive called borate. So after adding the borate, 40% borate, you're able to instead of releasing all your nitric oxide in the, within the first hour, see here is about 25 anoflux. You drop that down to about seven and you're able to release it for longer durations. Okay. So these catheters, we had controls that didn't release nitric oxide and then test samples that released nitric oxide and we implanted them in uh, rabbits, uh, adult male New Zealand whites. Um, and we monitored uh, how we monitored the catheters for patency. So every 20 minutes, we'll go in and try to draw blood. So we put them in the jugular and carotid arteries of the jugular vein and carotid artery of the rabbits. So every 20 minutes, we go and try to draw blood. Uh, and this, so a catheter that will clot will look like this. You you would not be able to draw any blood. It's completely occluded. All right. So this is the tip of the catheter, and this, is, this side is where we'll be drawing the blood. So the, here is an example of a catheter that released nitric oxide. That didn't clot. Yes, you see some micro aggregates along the catheter, but it never uh, did clot off like the control that did not release nitric oxide. So you did, we did a survival study. So all the anode releasing catheters survived uh, within the four hour study time. And, uh, the controls, only 30% uh, survived. Okay. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, it's possible to incorporate nitric oxide release chemistry into catheter walls. Uh, you can control the nitric oxide release duration. Uh, and uh, the anode releasing catheters that we made were able to, to prevent thrombosis or they remain patent in the short term animal model study.
Okay, so let's switch gears to, to um, coatings. So I talked about nitric oxide release. Let's talk about coatings. So this uh, polymer here uh, is called uh, dopamine carboxybutane metacrylate. This is a uh, carboxybutane metacrylate uh, section of it. And this is the dopamine section of it. And you, con you conjugate you conjugate that together to form uh, DOPA CBMA. Okay. This works like the PC polymer that I talked about on the endothelial cell. Uh, it's a hydrophilic polymer, so when you put this on the surface of a, a black contacting device, it would attract a lot of water, form a hydration layer, like a barrier between blood and the uh, procoagulant uh, medical device surface. All right, so this, this polymer has been applied uh, to glucose sensors, all right? So the, uh, it's an amperimetric uh, glucose sensor where the polymer was coated along the sensor, all right? And the polymer was, the perfor the, so it was used to measure glucose levels in blood, all right? And that polymer, was, the performance of that polymer was compared to a commercially available uh, sensor from Medtronic and also a test strip. Okay, the test strip, you just dip it in blood, you, you measure, uh, you throw it away. Next time you use a new, a fresh test strip. All right, so basically you, we want to compare um, how the experimental glucose sensor coated with the, with the zeroidionic polymer compares or performs alongside a commercial catheter and a disposable, commercial device and a disposable uh, strip. The, the black stars represent glucose level measurements by the test strip. The red represents uh, measurements obtained from the Medtronic sensor. And then the blue is the experimental sensor. You can see, and by the way, the blood glucose level uh, ranges between three to nine millimolar, the normal range of blood glucose level. So this uh, is exact lines are okay because they are within the range. You can see that the, the experimental sensor aligned very well to the test, testing strip, okay? While the, the Medtronic commercial sensor died in, in less than two days of testing because it absorbed protein. The protein formed a barrier um, over the sensor and then it became incapable of uh, sensing glucose levels in blood because uh, the glu it, there has to be a diffusion of glucose to the sensor uh, for detection. Okay. Now, so this is all great. The coatings are working really well, okay, but this is on a, on a non-flow situation. You know, it's a glucose sensor. You, you, you put it in blood, you measure it. What if you put the coating on a device that is always seeing blood flow? So with blood flow, you're gonna have shear, right? The shear, you're gonna have the coating being exposed to shear stresses. And with shear, there's a possibility of the coating getting washed off. If the coating gets washed off, then you're back to your, uh, your original biomaterial surface, and then clotting would uh, ensue again. Uh, so we wanted to, to, to study how how these coatings uh, are, the stability of the coatings under, under shear flow. Uh, so over the summer, I had a couple of students uh, through the SURF program, uh, they, they we, we made a PDMS polymer. Uh, they casted the polymer and then they put uh, the surface coat, the coatings on top of the PDMS. And uh, we met, and then we exposed the surface to uh, fibrinogen, which is a very important clotting factor. We want to see how well the coating is preventing the fibrinogen from absorbing, okay? So less fibrinogen absorption after the coating means the coating is working. High fibrinogen absorption means the coating is not working, okay? So once we did the initial measurements, we, you know, we, okay, we, we coated and said, okay, the surface is able to prevent fibrinogen absorption by 90%. And then we took the surface, the PDMS, and put them in an acrylic flow cell 
So this is a flow cell that has like two chambers. Uh, you can flow uh, fluids on the t through the top chamber, and you can also flow something different in the bottom chamber. Uh, this is the, uh, the CAD model where the red piece represents the PDMS membrane that has been modified. So here you can flow um, uh, blood uh, simulant over the surface and out and back again. So we put the flow cell in a circuit and we made, they were very busy over the summer, they made a bunch of uh, flow cells. Uh, we put them in, in pumps, uh, so these, are, these are perfusion pumps that I use clinically um, to basically pump blood from, your, from, your, from a patient's body into a device and back. So we wanted to simulate that condition as possible. Uh, and here is, uh, is a little video that I want to show of what, what they did. Um, so we had four pumps. Uh, each, each flow cell is flowing at a different, different flow rate. So this is going slower than that, slower than that, slower than that. So you, you are able to vary the shear stresses, the shear stresses that the surface would see. All right. So this is seeing about 10 dynes per centimeter squared, and then the first one is seeing about one. Uh, we picked these range because uh, we, we looked at a few medical devices and uh, the shear stresses that they would see all, all, be, all be imposed on them based on the location in the body will range from one dynes per centimeter squared to about 10. All right, so what, what is it? So after we, di we did the recirculation for eight hours, we took the surfaces out, and then we measured how well they would resist fibrinogen adsorption again. Remember, we did that before the circulation. Circulation now did the same thing again. And then the idea is to compare post-circulation data to pre-circulation data. Um, okay, so here is your data, fibrinogen adsorption control data. This is a PDMS that didn't get a coating. All right, and then these are all data from PDMS that were coated, uh, but they received different shear stresses. No shear, one, six, and 10. And so this here, this, did, this data compared to this data tells us that the coating is inhibiting fibrinogen adsorption down to about, uh, I think, 5%, which is really, really good, very, very good. And then when you expose that surface to one dynes per centimeter square of shear for eight hours, it goes up a little bit. Six goes up a little bit. So uh, this means that the, uh, the, the, the anchorage of the coating on the surface uh, isn't, isn't uh, that, I, I, isn't, isn't uh, you know, immune to shear forces. Shear forces can dislodge some of the coatings off the surface. And, uh, and so the, the, the takeaway from this is you want a coating that would remain on the surface and not get washed off. And so this data here uh, shows you the, uh, how the increase in fiber engine following, following due to shear. It goes up about 3%, three, three about 4% at 1 and 15% at, at uh, 10. All right, other things, uh, the other uh, projects we're working on is to look at the combination of nitric oxide release and surface coatings, okay? For nat if you have a surface that releases nitric oxide alone, it, uh, you know, I, like I said before, nitric oxide only works on the platelet. It doesn't work on fibrinogen. And so fibrinogen can still absorb on, on the surface. And then when they do, they can activate systemic uh, proteins that are flowing by and that can lead to systemic blood activation and if you have a surface coating where like I just showed you have shear stress washing some of them off or even the coating uh, wasn't done isn't perfect this the surface coverage of the coating uh, isn't perfect or the coating density is so low that you have some spots that, are, that, that, that don't have the coatings if you, that's happening you can still have uh, proteins uh, finding their way and adsorbing, okay? So in these two scenarios, you can have, you can still have platelet activation uh, leading to clot. If you com however, if you combine those two modalities together, uh, wherever you have 
coating imperfection, you have anode generation. And, and uh, so this is going to be working in tandem, right, to, to inhibit clotting better, to inhibit, inhibit clotting better. Because this is the way I think uh, blood vessels are doing it. Blood vessels are expressing nitric oxide or releasing nitric oxide. They are expressing hydrophilic uh, groups on their surfaces plus other functions. So one, we think one approach alone isn't going to cut it. So we, we have to kind of look at uh, a holistic approach per se. So an initial data on this idea is shown here. Uh, the same kind of work was done where we will flow uh, platelets, standardized platelet concentration over a coated surface, and then we measure how much platelets actually got absorbed on the, on the surfaces. So yes, yeah, so only uh, just PDMS surface, PDMS that release nitric oxide, PDMS with a coating, and then PDMS that release nitric oxide and with a coating. All right. So you have an incremental benefit as you uh, you know combine. You, you find some synergy benefits as you combine the two modalities together. Um, another project that. Uh, um, Rana, my EGAF student, is going to be working on. Uh, she's going to be making, uh, building a nitric oxide reactor, all right? Um, and the reactor we will allow us to put a PDMS membrane inside the reactor and charge it so that it can release nitric oxide. And this surface, this surface can serve as a platform to study how much NO can kill bacteria and not cause any damage to to uh, human cells. So it has application in, in wound dressings that uh, can get infected by bacteria. It has applications in, uh, you know, we can use that to study a nitric oxide effect on cancer cells um, because we know nitric oxide can get into, when they are upregulated to a, a certain concentration, they can get into cells and destroy the cell membrane destroy the DNA inside the cell, and that basically spells a recipe of cell death. Okay. So, but we really need some money for this. Uh, we need funding uh, to, to make all this happen. Um, another work that uh, one of my students is working on is, this is a, a baby project of mine. I want to make a prosthetic arm that costs 100 bucks. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's a lofty goal, but you know these prosthetic arms uh, that are on the market. You have to, you literally have to pay an arm and leg to buy one. Uh, uh, and so, if you make something that is cheap and functional, can be used to perform daily like routine tasks, it would have a, a bigger, widespread uh, impact than these uh, motorized uh, electronic arms that only a few can afford. So here are my students. I thank uh, Rana, Nikhil, Andrew, and Andre. Andre and Andrew worked with me. They were my surf students. Uh, Andrew is still working with me in the lab. I want to thank the NIH for uh, you know, financial support over the years and covering some of this work, the College of Engineering. Um, and I was also awarded a, a summer research grant and fund by UNH uh, to kind of help me get my, la my lab started up. Um, and so I think that concludes the talk. If you want to learn more about the work that we're doing in our lab, please uh, visit UNH BMDI lab. It stands for uh, Biomaterials and Medical Device Innov Innovation Lab. Uh, we, we, we are very interested in making a device that you, when you put into your you implant into the body, it would behave as if it's not there. The body doesn't recognize it. It's, it's like stealth surfaces. Um, and, you know, we, we, we want to, so we, we focus on, um, you know, st uh, primary studies where we will we'll modify surfaces and then we take that into device prototyping. And then we take the device and uh, test it on some animal model. Um, so that is the 
the uh, the plan for, for, for the lab. And uh, we're currently very interested in whoever wants to join the lab and get some research experience. Um, uh, just go to this website. Uh, you can contact us that way. And uh, if you have any questions, I, I will take them. Yes? Uh, with the rapid growth of 3D printers, do you feel as if like, uh, um, artificial lungs and prosthetics will become cheaper and easier to create? Or do you think that it's still going to be the same challenge as you Well, I think, uh, you know, with, with 3D uh, rapid prototyping, um, I think it's taken on a way where somebody would make, uh, like, make the a model and and put it out there as an open source. Uh, so I think it, that that's gonna uh, really help help uh, speed up uh, some of these uh, in innovations or, or putting the technology in many hands uh, and not just uh, people working in big research centers to work on these ideas. It will open, open up the technology that uh, uh, everybody can, can make improvements and, and also put it out there. And I think that's a, it's a, it's a good way to go. It will speed up innovation and uh, help, help everybody at large. Yeah. Okay, so so the, the nitric oxide release studies. Uh, the the next step that we want to take is conduct uh, long term studies where we'll make we'll make a material, let's say just a uh, a membrane, and and kind of we first of all you have to study how long the material can release the nitric oxide for. Okay. Uh, if you can release nitric oxide for three months, this is very, very good because um, you can you can transfer that surface into uh, artificial uh, uh, like a, um, artificial lungs. Uh, so if you can if you're able to support a patient for about three months uh, on the artificial lung, they tend to turn the corner. They they. They recuperate. They they get but the 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 lung function can go back to the level where uh, it can sustain uh, respiratory support. Uh, so uh, all of these. First of all, you have a surface like that that is able to release gases for a long time. It has to be tested on animal models for longer durations before it can go into into humans, uh, and, and and it takes takes money, you know, it takes, uh, <laughs> takes money and resources to, to, to do that. So, I mean, there are, there are a few, like the, the big universities uh, that, that have, you know, animal labs and, and big $10 million NIH grants, uh, they, they can actually do this sort of work where they attach a device to, to a 70 kilo sheep and have somebody on standby, you know, watching the animal, taking data for three, four, five, six months. Uh, uh, so these are like these are these things are happening, and also uh, NIH and big companies t would tend to fund uh, like you know clinical trials uh, or, or uh, uh, long-term studies uh, to 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 collect data. Uh, to get a technology ready to go into humans, so uh, you know it takes it takes resources and money to do that. But that's that's the tr that's what people that's what you want to do. You study something, you make sure it's working in a short term model. You go long term. <coughs> it depends on the application. If the if the device is going to stay inside a person for uh, let's say a stent forever, you put a stent in. You you need to make sure that. Uh, uh, you have conducted long-term studies of whatever treatment that you want to study uh, and, and have obtained uh, satisfactory data before it goes into to the human. Yes? If this surface works, would it be like expensive to 
like manufacture individual ones for each piece of equipment? Um, so the these surfaces, so for the coat, the surface coatings, the yeah. hydrophilic coatings is, it's a, uh, it's very, it's very easy to do. Uh, it it that the polymer would actually attach itself to, like metals, uh, polymers, ceramics, anything. It, it would because of the dopamine conjugate on the end of it. Dopamine is actually found in uh, the muscle footprint. So muscles, you know how they ship hulls, they attach themselves and they, can't, they don't get off. So that, whatever, th that gooey stuff that they use to attach themselves contains dopamine. It's been studied that dopamine is, is the, pro the fruit print. That. So, so this is why we have the dopamine being conjugated to the, to the PCB, so that when you expose it to any surface, it would just stick to it. Um, but we don't know how long it would stay on there, especially under flow conditions. But this is a very simple approach. I, sh uh, I should have shown a video where the way we did it. You put, you made, the, you make the polymer. You put the polymer in a, you create a buffer with the coating, coating polymer, and you put the PDMS into the buffer, and you agitate it, and it would just self-absorb onto the PDMS. Um, so it's a very simple approach, uh, but it's it's still in its initial stages. Uh, we have we know it, it's able to inhibit fouling, but we don't know how long we don't know how stable the coatings are. We know that muscles can stay attached to ship hulls for for uh, a long time and remain there. But you know you put this you 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 take only the dopamine and attach to a polymer and put it on a, on a surface. You have to study all of that to make sure. That uh, that surface the coatings will remain there. You know these clinical coatings that are on the market, like uh, heparin coatings and uh, PC coatings, Trillium. All of these I, we don't know how why they stop working after two weeks, but they do. Two weeks, the, all the, the devices will start to clot up again. And uh, these these are company products. There isn't much data out there that's telling telling us why they're failing. But I think one of the failing modes of surface coatings is the stability. You know, if they wash off, then you're back to your, your, sur your procoagulant surface, and then it's going to start to clot up again. If they remain there, it's going to work. Uh, so. Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, so the these uh, implants, I think the so they don't they don't see blood flow, but however they interact with uh, you know, tissue. So I, one of the I think one of the major uh, problems in in that area is implant site infection. Uh, so you know, for for an infection to occur, the bacteria has to attach itself on the surface of the device. Uh, and uh, actually, there's some work on the PCB coatings uh, showing uh, that fouling, fouling by any, fouling in general is, is reduced uh, when you have these uh, surfaces coated with the, with the polymer. Uh, but I think the, I, th I think the major issue there is, is uh, bacteria uh, infection at the implant site, uh -huh. um, and, and yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, what about those other drugs that are infectious? Is 
So, so at the at the right, so currently I can tell you that the right uh, level of nitric oxide concentration that will will the kill these microbes, and the right level. So the amount of nitric oxide that will kill these microbes and not harm human cells, we don't know. Okay, we don't know. Uh, Yeah, so macrophages, yeah. immune cells would upregulate the nitric oxide, all right, to a level that would be that would kill uh, a microbe, all right. Uh, but it's very difficult to measure to measure uh, endogenous nitric oxide levels. Very very difficult to do that. Uh, the levels that I showed here uh, that that I released by. Uh, endothelial cells are are actually computational models. Okay. Is it so are we talking about the nanomolar levels of uh, so, the so phases or are we talking about the micromolar? So micro so the micromolar levels of nitric oxide has been shown to inhibit coagulation on blood contact in medical devices. Uh, and there's a study out there that looked at uh, gas concentration, like uh, this, they said 200 parts per million of nitric oxide gas concentration is able to kill bacteria. 200 parts per million. So th this was. Th this is not, this is uh, an in vitro work where they cultured bacteria cells. They flowed nitric oxide gas in different concentrations. Mm -hmm. And then this, is this was the, you know, the report at 200 parts per million. Uh, uh, bacteria colonies were, were reducing, you know, the they're not growing. And they looked at derma cells and it had no uh, DNA damage to derma cells. I mean, there's there's a lot to be to be done here. Uh, so uh, this is why I, I am putting Rana on, on this uh, nitric oxide release project. She's going to look at you know different levels of nitric oxide and how they interact with different cell lines as as well as microbes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. This one. So, so the the uh, the polymer, the doper PCBMA polymer, is currently not. It's currently an experimental uh, uh, polymer, and it's uh, you know to, to to I can tell you to make a, a hundred microgram of this polymer takes like four days. The yield, you, you start off with, uh, the, the yield uh, is about 20%. You know, it's very, very small. Uh, so it, it would take some, it, it's, it's difficult to, to estimate, you know, how, how much uh, additional cost is going to add on to an existing device use. Uh, it, it, it's, it's. I, I can't. I can. I can really make an estimate on that. On how, you know how much. Let's say artificial lung, adult lung. Uh, it's about four thousand dollars a piece, and uh, those on the market with coatings go to about eight thousand dollars. Okay. So uh, Johnson and Johnson, Medtronic, uh, Terumo. These are all companies that make the device. They also have versions of the device with coatings. Uh, so. I th it may be along the same lines, uh, but it, it, 
it would it would uh, again it would it would depend on you know how the, the manufacturing process, the yield, you know, the amount of resources you put into into synthesizing the polymer. Uh, the, you know, polymer to polymer synthesis will be different, so the resource, the amount of resource you put in will also vary. Uh, but uh, it, it, with with the coding, you put the coding on a, on a device, the price will go up. By how much with the PCB, it's, it's difficult to estimate. Thank you very much, Dr. Right. Thank you.